This is a sermon by Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, July 7, 2013, at Holy Cross Episcopal Church, Winter Haven, Florida. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you take us as people whom you know and love, and you form us together in a group of people who know you, who love you, and who serve you. I pray this morning, both member and visitor alike, that you would fold us together into your love and into your mercy, that you would open our hearts and our minds to you and to what you want to do in us this morning, the work you wish to accomplish, and what you want to do through us in the love and care that we show to one another. So we say, open our hearts to you and speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's great to be with you this morning. Uh, my wife and I had an amazing time last night. And uh, hearing the story of the things that have happened, particularly over the course of the last two years here. And it was a joy. I mean, all I could hear was stories about how God really had taken a group of people that had been profoundly fractured and begun to build them together again in a way that's really extraordinarily remarkable. Only God could do the thing that has happened in the life of this church. And boy, I saw it last night. And it was, it was a joy, an absolute joy to be a part of it. And so in the midst of this time, when you all are being, in essence, rebuilt, the new people are coming in, and there's a new kind of takeoff in terms of the things that are going on, I think it's worth it to ask, especially this is the Sunday after Independence Day, what kind of church does this community need? If God is going to move through the life of this congregation, in a way that actually makes a difference in the lives of the people who are here, and the people who have yet to come here, and the people who may never ever darken the door, but he still loves them, and how do we reach out to them? What kind of church does it take for that to be able to happen? And I quite honestly think it is encapsulated in the lessons this morning, and especially in the college. See this? Would you turn to this in your bulletin? Front page, where it says, Colic of the Day. The collect of the day is meant to set a theme, a tone, a, a kind of, okay, this is what we're going to really talk about this morning in terms of what the lessons actually mean and say. So they set a framework, in other words, through how we look at those lessons. And it talks about two things that we are asking God to really help us to be able to accomplish. It says, grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, because we need God's help to do this one. That we may be devoted to you, Jesus, with our whole heart. And, secondly, united to one another in pure affection. And it seems to me how that, what that looks like is laid out in very clear terms over the course of these lessons. So, that's what I want to talk about briefly. First of all, devoted to you, meaning devoted to Jesus with our whole heart. For that to happen... There has to be a breakthrough inside. There has to be that sense that whether it's a gradual awakening, whether it is a dramatic conversion, something happens that breaks into my life and causes me to know that I really need God. I need him. In other words, for all of the language about learning how to stand on your own two feet and take responsibility for your life and set your own path and do the things that you know you're supposed to do, all of that language, which at some ways makes some sense, I'm facing the fact that no matter how many times I really try to get it together, there's always something dragging me down. Even if I look at this phenomenal presentation, by the way, this morning, uh, the kids with the Ten Commandments, if you look at those closely, any adult would look at them especially and go, ooh. I got reminded of something I wish I was that wasn't in my life. At least once, if not all ten, right? Not your head, I'm bring this together. <laughs> and they're meant to do that. In fact, one of the purposes of the law 
was not merely to tell us what the difference is between right and wrong, but it's also meant to awaken in our hearts the fact that if you really tease out the implications of these commandments, then, ooh, I fall short. It's not that I'm not trying. Although, if you really want to be honest, isn't it true? There are times when we actually really like the thing that we know is wrong. And we don't try at all because we really enjoy it. And, and we sort of let ourselves off the hook by saying, if you're Christians anyway, oh, you know, well, I guess I can do this, and I know later I'll ask God to forgive me and it'll be okay. <laughs> we sort of play that kind of game with each other, and it has everything to do with the fact that, as Paul says in the book of Romans, I agree that the law is good. Isn't anything up here that I disagree with? It is the right set of commandments. As the little tune they sang said, it's as true today as it was thousands of years ago. But that doesn't mean I have it in me to be able to do all those things. Right? I can try. And I do try most of the time. But there's always going to be this gap between what that says I'm supposed to do and what's actually happening inside. In fact, even if you really want to get down to how Jesus talks about the law and the Sermon on the Mount, it, it's not just even merely a question of making this distinction between what I actually do. Jesus even pushes the envelope a little bit harder by saying, no, 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 even it has to do with what's going on in your heart because you know, there are plenty of times where we actually wouldn't want to kill with our bare hands. But there are times when, particularly if we've been deeply wounded, we sort of kill them by closing off our hearts to them. We don't have to be nice, cordial, friendly, but that doesn't mean our heart is actually warm toward them. Just the opposite. We, <laughs> we keep our distance. So it's sort of murder by emotion. That's what Jesus taught. And so the more I tease into that, the more I begin actually to see this gap between what God gave Moses on Sinai, the commandment of God to his people, and what's actually happening within the depths of my heart. Now that isn't all that's there. There are other things. I can be good and altruistic. I can give. I can serve. I can even be well thought of. I can have a great reputation. But it's not entirely clean. And I, I know that if I'm willing to be honest with and God intentionally, get this, he intentionally sets up, because he knows whereof we are made, as it says. He knows that there is this gap, this serious gap, between what the law says and what actually is the condition of my heart. And he does that precisely because what he wants to do is not us to somehow try harder. There's a lot of Christian teaching that says, well, the real answer to all of this is try harder. Um, I mean, I can grip my teeth and bear my fists, but that doesn't necessarily mean my heart has changed. I'm just giving it more effort. No, this is meant to bring me to the point where no matter how hard I try, I can feel the gap. And there is a part of me that is pained by the fact that there is that gap. And I need God to break in and change I need God to do something inside of me that I cannot do for myself. And I admit that freely and clearly. That I need forgiveness, not just acting like, well, you know, we all have our choices and I made my choice. As if it were all bad and neutral. But that in fact, I've sinned and I need the forgiveness of God. And then in bringing that forgiveness, what begins to happen inside of me is that I begin to discover something new. I begin to discover devotion. Gosh, God really loves me. I'm not just kind of out there on my own, but it is actually personally true. For me, the promise that says, Lo, Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the ages. And I know as I go through my life that I'm actually not going through it alone, that God loves me and that he is with me. He has sent his son Jesus to die for me and to forgive me. I belong to him. 
I am his and he will never let me go. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he is the one that begins to fill in the gaps so that what I begin to know in my life is a new level of his peace and his mercy and his joy. Am I perfect? I am not perfect. But what I do know is that God's at work in my life. He receives me as his own and he will never let me go. When those kinds of experiences begin to break into our heart, what begins to happen is, and this is the word of the colleague, we begin to experience devotion. That means commitment. That I'm devoted to him. Yeah. He did something for me that I could never do for myself. I owe him everything. I belong to him. And so we're asking God to help us that we may be devoted to him. How? With our whole heart. That God might continue to change me and transform me so that what begins to happen in my life more and more is the fact that I know that I love him and that I belong to him and that even in the midst of the darkest times, the most difficult times, I am not abandoned, I am not rejected, I am not forsaken, but that really nothing, not sin, not loss, not the devil himself, not the worst kinds of crime, no matter what, God is there and he will never let me go. Does that make sense to you? That's devotion. And we're asking God to work that devotion, kind of devotion in our lives. Because the reason is, number one, that's what he wants. He wants us to have that kind of dignity and that kind of peace and that kind of grace about our lives. that we know that we're his. And we can walk through life with a wondrous sense of, I belong. I'm not rejected. I'm his. And that out of that, God forms not just doing that in me. He actually builds me into a group of people that are coming to know the very, very same thing. And because they understand things of, that God is doing in my life in a way that other people just do not, we begin to be knit together. And I begin to discover the mercy and love of God, not just God me, but I begin to see it in the way others are committed to me and me to them. God, in essence, begins to form a family of people that love and care for each other deeply. And that's the second part, that we may be united to one another in pure affection. So, how does the scripture lay all of that out? First has to do with Naaman and Syria, the first lesson, Elisha. Remember, you heard the story read? Naaman, big, powerful military official in Syria, has leprosy and he's he must have heard something in Israel about the fact that there are miracles going on. So he sends letters and says, I want to get healed. And of course, that drives the king crazy. Am I a god that I can make life, he says. He's and he doesn't know what to do. He tears his clothes because if he's not healed, we could be killed. And then Elijah hears it and he says, what's the matter? Send him to me. And so Naaman arrives with this extraordinary huge entourage. And it's actually a kind of funny scene. If you think of it, here's Elijah, and he's in this, well, in essence, a kind of probably a little hut. And you can see in the distance this troop of 50 horses, servants, an entourage of people, bodyguards. Naaman is a very important man, and he is not traveling alone. If we were to tell this story in present day parlance, it would be somehow you pulled up into a trailer park and with five limousines pulled out front. And Elisha knows who it is. And he doesn't do a thing. He doesn't walk out of his house. He doesn't open the door to greet him. He just says, tell him to go wash over in the river Jordan seven times. And he'll be well. Naaman is outraged. Rudeness has just happened. He has, this is not the courtesy owed a person of his distinction. He should have come out. And then he says, he said, I would have expected him to like him. What he's actually describing is one of his own shaman magicians in Syria. That he would have come out, he would have called on the name of his God, he would have waved his hand. He would have, in other words, done some kind of magic and it would have happened there right in front of me. Why do I have to go wash in that dirty river Jordan? And it is dirty. He said, you know, the waters of Damascus are better. But what was God doing? God was trying to break into Naaman's pride. 
And in essence saying that this very powerful ruler, Naaman, you want God? It's on God's terms, not yours. Are you willing for that to happen? Some of us actually aren't, because we want life on our terms. But that was the lesson for Naaman. So Naaman bends, and his servant says, look, what's... And he goes out, and of course, he's completely healed. How does that relate to this? It's because part of what God does is that he intentionally put things in our lives to cause us to know that we in our own strength just don't get it, and we need that dependence from God. And when that begins to happen, and things begin to occur in our lives, that only increases our love for him. The same thing is true in the gospel story with the sending of the 70. Two by two, in other words, you're not lone rangers. You go out and you're counting on the other person to stand with you. And as they begin to go out, extraordinary things begin to occur. And they are thrilled beyond imagination. Lord, even the demons are subject to us. And when people go out on mission, God does amazing things through them. Things that we don't normally see in our local churches. And they come back and they're all excited about it. And he said, look, I'm glad you're excited. But what you need to know is that your relationship with me is actually more important than the security you get out of that than anything that you see happening out there in the miraculous. Jesus wants to let them know what's important to me is you being devoted to me, is what Jesus is saying. Sure, I'll do things to you, but that's not the live or death, the life or death moment. What's really important is that you are bound to me. That's what really matters. So all of that is the devoted to him with our whole heart. The other piece, united to one another in pure affection, that's the Galatian lesson. Let me show it this way. He doesn't know me to do this. Can you give me a hand? Can you come up for a minute? What's your name? Zachary. Now Zach's going to help you guys know Zach, right? So Zachary's going to help me. Now here's, let's, let's do this one. Walk over here with me. Now this little group here, we're, we're Holy Cross. We're a church and we care about each other and we're really glad to be together. But something happens to Zachary. He gets mad. Somebody says something to him that's really, really hurtful. And so what does he do? Come over here. He walks away. Then you stop right there. Now, what's the right thing to do? Here's typically what happens. Everybody over here goes, you know, he was such a good kid. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I mean, maybe he wasn't raised right. What are, what's his mom and dad doing about all of this? How come he's rebelling like this? You know, I always knew there was something wrong with that family. <laughs> now, that's exactly what Paul is saying in the Galatians. <laughs> Because you see, that's not united to one another in pure affection, is it? No, no. Paul says to the Galatians that restoration needs to happen. So that instead of having that conversation that's gossipy and critical, the conversation is, we, first of all, we need to be praying for Zach right away. I'm wondering if there's something going on in this family that we can do something about that's showing up in Zach's rebellious behavior. Or is there somebody that... Zach really relates to him the life of this church that actually could go sit with him and talk with him. And so finally somebody goes, yeah, I can, I can do that. He's been in my classes or, you know, his kids play with my kids. And yeah, we'll take him over for dinner and maybe we can talk to him and see what's going on. That, you see, is restoration. Thank you, Zach. You see, it is absolutely impossible to be a group of people who genuinely love God with their hearts, whose hearts are being softened by that sense of he belongs to me, I belong to him, and he will never let me go. And at the same time going, what's wrong with that kid? It's schizophrenic. If God is going to soften our hearts, he softens our hearts not just to him, but he also softens our hearts to one another. And we realize that the commitment that Jesus has made to us is the same commitment we choose to make to one another. Because that's what it means to be a Christian family together. That's why Jesus would say, by this shall all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
Now, does that mean we always like one another? No. Does that mean we always approve of what one another's doing? No. Does that mean that we always theologically agree with one another? No. What binds us together is not our common theology. What binds us together is not our common likes and dislikes when it comes to behavior. What binds us together is the fact that we understand that God has built us together and he has called us to be committed to one another because he is just that committed to us. What kind of church does Winter Garden need in the midst of the many churches that are here? It needs a body of people who love Jesus without apology and with great joy, and who are learning to live out their life with one another in a way that causes other people out there to go, I cannot believe the way they sacrifice for each other. And how they even reached out to one of their neighbors, and you know, I, they didn't even know him hardly. They just knew that there was a need, and bam, people were right there. That's what the college is praying about. That's what we ask God to help us do. I believe that's the kind of church that this community needs. If that happens, people won't be able to stay away because they have had it with religion that has no compassion. They have had it with law that doesn't care for people. They want people who know joy, not just legalism, and they want people who know how to lay down their lives for each other. And they are learning how to do that. And understand that this community is their mission field. And they're there to serve and make a difference. If you really want to grow as the church of the Holy Cross, where sacrifice is embodied, that's how it happens. And I'm thrilled to say to you that especially what I saw last night, all of the seats for that are happening. God bless you for that. But pray the prayer again. We're going to pray it again together. And ask God to take the good things that he is doing here and continue to expand them. Okay, so collect of the day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray this out loud together. Oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 